Thank you. Well, let me first thank the organizers for this superb organization in this amazing city and for not just for one workshop, for a whole series of workshops. And um, thank the, the host for incredible hospitality, but uh, also thank Rod Downey for giving us a reason to have all of these meetings in wonderful places. And I hope, I hope the meetings continue. So this is a, a story about how computability theory and computable model theory uh, interfere and how computability theory influences developments in computable model theory, but it's also very different. It shows the differences between the, the two fields. And this is an area uh, to which Rod has uh, extensively contributed, especially in his earlier days, and then there was a period when not much was happening in the field, and more recently, the field has become active again, in both in computable model theory and in reverse math. There have been some recent results. Um, since I expected the students in the audience, I will review all the notions and make the talk self-contained. So by E, we denote the lattice of computable enumerable sets, so this is now we're dealing with computability theory, or if you want, the structure of omega with equality, which is a special structure. So E is the lattice of C, uh, vector, uh, of C sets. It's a distributive lattice under inclusion, intersection, and union. And there's associative, associated lattice E star, so that's lattice, the quotient lattice of C sets modulo finite sets. So here, the, we don't distinguish between sets which differ by finitely many elements. And within this distributive lattice sits the Boolean algebra of computable sets, which are exactly the complemented elements uh, in E. And in his quest to find uh, a computably enumerable set, which is uh, the Turing degree of which is strictly between zero and zero jump, Poe started defining various C sets with thin complements. So the notion of immunity um, came from him. So a set of uh, natural numbers is immune if it's infinite, and it doesn't contain infinite C sets. So if W is contained in C, that forces W to be uh, finite. And a set is simple if its complement is immune and the set is CE. Um, well, the, this didn't quite solve the, the problem. The, problem of finding intermediate Turing degrees. So stronger notions were developed, stronger notion of simplicity and immunity. So if uh, by dn we denote the finite set with canonical index n, and a strong array of finite sets uh, is just a, it's, it's a, just a computable enumeration of finite sets given by a computable function g. And uh, they, they also pairwise disjoint. So if i is different from j, then dgi is disjoint from d. GJ. Uh, set is hyperimmune if it's infinite and there is no such, a, such an array. There is no such a sequence such that every finite set in the array intersects C because that will allow us to extract uh, a C set. And again, a hypersimple set is one which is computably enumerable and the complement is hyperimmune. Uh, there's even a stronger notion um, and the name reflects that hyper hyperimmune set. Uh, is, a, is a set, the definition is the same as for hyperimmune, but the, the strong array, DGI, is replaced by a weak array. Again, finite sets, but they're given as C sets. So they're given WGI, where G is a computable function. And a set is HH simple if it's uh, C and its complement is HH immune. So the See, there's a stronger and stronger notion. So H H simple implies H simple and implies simple. The implications are not reversible. And um, Decker showed that every non-zero computably enumerable Turing degree contains an H simple set. So they are um, later, of course. And uh, on the other hand, the C degrees, which are degrees of hyper-hyper simple sets, are exactly the high degrees. And the high means uh, the jump equals the uh, zero double jump. So with every C set, we also have 
the principal filter that it determines in the lattice of all C sets, and I'll denote it by E of A with the upper arrow, sometimes just denoted by E of A. And so these are all C sets which contain A as its subset. And um, the interesting characterization is that A is uh, hyper, hyper simple exactly when the lattice E star, so that's the one which is star different from E, of this lat the lattice determined by the principal filter is a Boolean algebra. And we can even say uh, more about it. I, I just can't review all the, of the, like the first part of Soar's old book. <laughs> so there is a, even stronger notion of, uh, of immunity toward uh, C sets. So that's a notion of cohesiveness, which will be extremely important for us. So a set is cohesive if it's infinite and it cannot be split by a C set into two infinite parts. So if, if W is a C set, then either W intersection C or W complement intersection C is finite. So if we have, Omega, and this is C, this is C complement. So if we have W and W complement, so either this part has to be finite or this part has to be finite. Uh, in other words, if, uh, if W intersection C is infinite, then W kind of contain all of C, star contain all of C. And similarly, if W uh, complement intersection C is infinite, then W complement will star contain all of C. And it can be shown that cohesive sets are HH immune, and the converse is not true. And again, we're interested in C sets, the complements of which have this, this prop immunity properties. And a set is maximal if it's uh, CE and its complement is cohesive. And maximal sets were uh, extremely, it was an, a, a very important notion in, in classical computability theory. Uh, another way to view maximal set is a set which is, uh, CE, and uh, such that if we have, if we now take a C set which contains, so we can take the union of W and, and M, so if we have this C set E which contains M, then either E minus M has to be finite or Omega minus E has to be finite. Okay, so this is all the... Uh... And of course, uh, it's not clear that these sets even exist. Friedberg shows that maximal sets exist. And what does that mean in E star is that E star has coatoms. So E doesn't have atoms, doesn't have coatoms, but E star has coatoms and those are maximal sets. Um, not every set has a maximal superset, and those sets that uh, do not are called atomless, or should be called coatomless. Uh, and Lachlan showed that there is an atomless HH simple set. Uh, what that means is that uh, the lattice E star, the, the principal filter determined by H in the E star lattice, is an atomless Boolean algebra. So it doesn't have coatoms, so it doesn't have atoms, so it's an atomless Boolean algebra. And it's a Boolean algebra because it's an HH simple set. And uh, similarly to H, uh, to hyper hyper simple sets, the Turing degrees of maximal sets, the C Turing degrees, of course, are exactly the high degrees. And then the, uh, an amazing result in, in uh, computability theory was due to Soar, where he showed that uh, in, when looking at the automorphisms of the lattice E and lattice E star, the maximal sets belong to the same orbit. So for any two maximal sets, M1 and M2, there is an automorphism of E, and hence by E star, because they're all induced by ones on E, so that phi of M1 equals M2. And same with the, with the star classes. So, um, what did I do? I'm going backwards, sorry. So both E and E star have continued many automorphisms, and that was known even before. Um, there is uh, an even uh, stronger notion of, of uh, cohesiveness, and that is instead of, uh, th there's another notion of cohesiveness. Uh, 
uh, where instead of uh, C sets, we look at splitting by computable sets, which also can be uh, very useful in, uh, in computable model theory. And that's a notion of R cohesiveness. I guess R stands for recursive. So set C is R cohesive if it's infinite, and for every computable set W, either W intersection C or W complement intersection C is finite. So it cannot be split by computable sets. And uh, then there's an associated notion of R maximal, which is C and the complement is R cohesive. And of course, every cohesive set is R cohesive, because if it cannot be split by, uh, by C sets, then it cannot be split by computable sets. Uh, hence, every maximal set is R maximal, and it can be shown that converse is not true. If we have together uh, HH simple sets are not necessarily maximal, but R maximal and HH simple implies maximality, and that's uh, very easy to see by analyzing the lattices. If a set is R maximal and HH simple, then the principal filter E star determined by M on one hand has no non-trivial complemented elements by the definition of our maximality. On the other hand, every element is complemented because we have a Boolean algebra. So E star uh, uh, M, the upper, the, the principal filter determined will be a two element Boolean algebra and therefore the set will be maximal. And um, this is the last of these kinds of notion that does, if we look at intersection of finitely many maximal sets, we have a quasi-maximal set. And we say, so a set B is quasi-maximal intersection of N um, maximal sets, MI. And if uh, these sets are uh, pairwise star disjoint, then N is called the rank of, of the quasi-maximal set B. And quasi-maximal sets are HH simple. The converse is not true. And uh, it's interesting that the principal filter determined by a quasi-maximal set of rank N is a Boolean algebra of size 2 to the N um, denoted by BN. This is an exercise in, in source book. And the source result about automorphisms of maximal sets also implies that if we have two quasi-maximal sets of the same rank, then there is an automorphism of the lattice E, and similarly for E star, which maps B1 to B2. <coughs> so it was proposed by Metakidas and Nerod when they started look, applying more advanced methods, such as priority methods to computability theory, in some sense, develop modern computability, uh, computable model theory in the, in the 70s and early 80s. So they ask uh, to look at, uh, at a, some structures, uh, for example, a structure of, of vector spaces, and see whether we have uh, and develop a similar theory to the one that existed for just C sets. So here we look at, uh, at our big vector space, uh, denoted by V infinity. We can think of it, uh, so it's a computable, uh, Aleph zero dimensional vector space over computable field could be finite or infinite, or if it's infinite, we can assume it's Q. And a lot of our results will be only for Q because we don't know how to deal with other fields. And we need, we need dependence. So that what's, what's important about uh, vector spaces, and that was noted even by, uh, by uh, Maltsev and, and people earlier, uh, Froelich and Shepardson, what's important about vector spaces is the dependence algorithm. So we want in this nice copy, nice big copy of infinity to have a dependence algorithm. And that can be handled by having uniformly computable dependence relations dn, where n stands for n dependence, for having n vectors dependent. And that can allow us to have a computable language. So we can think of uh, these elements and vectors, uh, which are infinite sequences of elements from the field, but they have only finitely many non-zero components. And the vector addition is pointwise. So we add all the components, and the scalar multiplication is pointwise. And we have a very nice uh, standard computable basis for V-infinity, one which has ones at one place and zeros elsewhere. So uh, in this structure, we also have a copy of natural numbers in some sense. Every computable basis gives us a copy of natural numbers. So we have two structures associated. Um, so we say the subspace is computably enumerable if it's only a C set of V infinity. So it's a space which is a C set. Because uh, it's not always clear what a C substructure or a C structure means. 
And so we have a corresponding lattice here of C vector spaces um, determined under in inclusion under a substructure uh, containing a substructure. The intersection is the intersection of vector spaces, but the supremum, the plus, is not exactly union, but it's a closure of the union. So it's the least space generated by the two. And now we get, uh, again, a lattice of C vector spaces. <coughs> this lattice is no longer distributive, but it's a modular lattice. Modular means that we have kind of a half of the distributivity law. So if x is less or equal than b, then x uh, union a intersection, x um, join a intersection b is x join a um, and x join b, but then x join b is b. So x, x uh, or a and b is x or a and b. So now we can, uh, because we have dependence algorithm, we can enumerate all C independent subsets of E infinity, and that enumeration is I0, IN. And um, if we take the closure, so these are all independent subsets, and then if we look at a closure, at the span of each of them, we have effective enumeration of of C vector spaces. So this is now what used to be W in E. This is what uh, we have these vector spaces in the lattice of, of uh, L V infinity. And um, not everything is complemented in that lattice. Uh, uh, a C space V is complemented exactly when, uh, well, there, there are many equivalences, but uh, here are several. There is a dependence algorithm over V, so mod V, or the quotient structure of infinity over V has a dependence algorithm. Or another way is that V is generated by a computable subset of a computable basis for V infinity. Because some of the, an easy way to get a space is just to look at a computable basis for V infinity, take some or C or computable subset and, and the generated. Also, this, uh, this is equivalent to every C um, basis can be extended to a computable basis for V infinity. So again, dependence algorithm plays uh, an important role. So, uh, Dependence very much depends on how many vectors we have. So we have this dn, n dependence uh, relations. And um, so n means we have exactly n vectors. And dn of v is a set of all of these vectors which are dependent. So d of v, the whole dependence relation, is a union of all of this for n greater or equal than 1. For n equals 1, we just have v, basically. These relations are c. And the dn is Turing reducible to dn plus 1. And of course, dn is Turing reducible to d, to the whole dependence relation. And this uh, dependence is uniformly in n. So this uniformity was also important before. And then how hard is, say, 3 dependence versus 2 dependence? Well, they're not the same. And sure show that um, if we have a prescribed sequence of C sets, C1, C2, C, and so on, and we have C at the end, and um, Cn is Turing reducible to Cn plus 1, and Cn is Turing reducible to C uniformly in N, and if we look at V infinity over any infinite field, but it has to be infinite, then there is a vector space. There is a, C, a vector space in LV infinity such that uh, the end dependence of this vector space has the same Turing degree as the set prescribed set Cn, and the, vector, the, the whole dependence relation of the space is of Turing degree C. And with uh, Dimitrov and Morozov, we combine this construction with another construction um, because we're looking at computable automorphism groups. And we show that we can do this, plus we can assure that uh, the space V infinity over V has only trivial computable automorphism groups. So the automorphism group contains only those computable uh, automorphism which has to contain, uh, which are scalar multiplications. 
Now we need C1 to be uh, computable because we want this vector space to be computable so the quotient space is computable. The quotient space V infinity over V is computable if the vector space V is computable. And we also want C to be non-computable, the whole dependence algorithm. We need that in the proof. So uh, back to the maximal spaces, to the question of metakitis in the road. Well, uh, can, we, uh, can we find uh, a space which has the same property, similar property like <clears throat> one for, for the natural numbers? So a space M such that if we have any uh, uh, space which uh, contains it, no, this is now space V. I want to use the same notation as on my slides. Then, uh, so either this part is finite, but finite means finite dimensional, or the part to the whole space is finite dimensional. So more precisely, if, so a uh, space V is maximal, First of all, if, uh, if V infinity over V is of infinite dimension, so this corresponds to being infinite set. So now we have dimension, and dimension is very different from a set. Being infinite set is different from being infinite dimension. And um, so set V is maximal if for every uh, superset W, um, Either the dimension of W over V is finite or the dimension of uh, V infinity over W is finite. So we can split uh, the complement this way. And Metakitis in the road modified the state construction to the new setting and showed that actually maximal spaces exist. There's another way to get a maximal space and that was done by, by Shor. So if we look at a computable basis of E infinity, and we can basically identify this with, with omega, and, um, and take a maximal, if we take a maximal subset of that basis, just in the, in the sense of sets, then the space, the space that it spans is a maximal space of E infinity. So some maximal spaces come from the basis but not all, uh, which was shown by Nerod, Metakides, and Remel. So um, independent sets uh, cannot be always effectively extended. So we say that the independent set of vectors J is non-extendable, first of all, if V infinity over closure of J is of infinite dimension, so it's not trivial. And for every, for every C independent set which contains J, the, so these, these, were, these were independent sets, the, the difference between uh, IE and J is finite. And the maximal spaces where no C basis is extendable, extendable to the basis of the, of the whole space, in this case because it's a maximal. So um, other finer notions of maximality were developed by dealing with exact dimension. And that's the notion of a k vector space. So k is just a number. So um, a vector space is k if, again, v infinity over v is infinite dimensional. But if, um, if WE contains that space, then either, either the difference between, uh, well, either there are finitely many vectors uh, from, dub, from the super space with respect to space, all the, there are at most finitely many, uh, at most k many vectors in V infinity um, minus V. So more precisely, if VE contains V, either the dimension of V E over V is finite, or the dimension, the whole space V uh, mod V infinity mod V is at most K. And this K is actually reached. Uh, it's actually, actually there is a space where there are exactly K many vectors uh, in this quotient space V infinity over V is zero. So we're now controlling uh, the exact finite dimension between V infinity and the superspace. And it was shown that for k, even for k zero, this makes sense, which zero thin will, zero thin will mean that, we'll see later, uh, that basically it has to equal uh, v infinity. 
Uh, so these spaces exist for each k, and that gives us uh, that gives us an infinite sequence of maximal spaces um, such that there is no automorphism. So for every automorphism of the whole lattice LV infinity, um, Ti will not go into Tj as long as i is different from j. So we have all of these maximal spaces and they're not uh, in the same orbit. So the natural question is, is there an analog, is there LV infinity analog of source theorem? Is there a notion of maximality which will uh, g give us an interesting orbit? And um, this question about finding interesting orbits was also posed by uh, Downey and Remmel in the handbook of recursive mathematics. So k thin spaces where k equals zero are zero thin spaces, and they're also called supermaximal. Um, I guess the same as like hyper hyper simple, except here we're using super instead of hyper. So zero thin spaces are supermaximal. What does that mean? That means if uh, if uh, if V is contained in W, then either dimension between W and V is finite, or W equals V infinity, so that that layer is of zero dimension between V infinity and W. And it was shown that these spaces exist, well, those are zero thin spaces. <clears throat> and they were, and, but then this didn't give the orbit. There are some other results which I didn't include because um, this was just for the sake of time. And uh, these supermaximal spaces didn't, uh, didn't um, give an orbit. Uh, also, there were results showing that they can exist in various degrees, but they're not automorphic under automorphisms of the whole lattice. So then an uh, even stronger notion was developed by, by Hurd, uh, uh, strongly supermaximal. And this notion looks somewhat uh, a little bit more model theoretic and can be adjusted to, to models outside of vector spaces. So supermaximal means that if we have a C subset, just a subset in, um, in the complement in V infinity, V infinity minus V, then we can somehow um, enclose that subset by finitely many vectors. So there, there are finitely many vectors, um, x0 to x a0 to a n minus 1, so that x will be contained in the closure of v and uh, v and all of these like, uh, vectors, a, the vectors a0 to a n minus 1. And uh, I think this is the strongest notion that was developed for uh, maximality of vector spaces, and uh, Downey and Hurt show that these spaces actually exist because it's not obvious that they exist. And that also that every strongly supermaximal space is supermaximal. Uh, that can be shown. The converse is not true, so it's a, it's a true notion. But then came this like uh, important result of Downey and Hurt that if we start with any non-zero computably enumerable Turing degrees, uh, we can construct, they can construct two strongly supermaximal spaces, U and V, so that for every automorphism phi of, of the whole lattice LV infinity, phi of U does not equal U. So this, 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 is, this notion also does not give us, give us orbits. So, uh, so we took a, a more modest task, and that is, with uh, Rumen Dimitrov, and that is it looking for, for some very special maximal and quasi-maximal sets, uh, spaces. Those are the ones that are generated by maximal and quasi-maximal uh, subsets of the computable basis of the whole space. So again, omega is a computable basis of infinity, and we look, uh, so this is the, the, the setup, we look at a quasi-maximal subset of omega of rank n, just quasi-maximal in the, in the omega sense, and look at the space that it generates. So Dimitrov showed that if we look at the, at the principal filter in uh, L, L star infinity, then uh, in, the, in the case of, of C sets, we got only Boolean algebra, Bn. But here we can have three kinds of... Uh, of these lattices. One is a Boolean algebra Bn, 
We can also get a lattice of all subspaces of, of an n-dimensional space, some n-dimensional space, over some field, which is not necessarily the field of E infinity, but it's a, I'll describe it later. It's an extension of that field. So this is the lattice of subspaces. So here we can get these modular lattices, like um, ones that contain uh, what we call 1, 3, 1, or even infinitely many. And also we can get a finite product of structures from the previous two cases, finite product of these Boolean algebras, BN, and these lattices of subspaces, of finite dimensional subspaces. And uh, what does a product mean? It's just a, a product of two uh, partially ordered sets. Uh, a, the, so the pairs have to be uh, less or equal component-wise. For example, B, BN can be viewed as a product of B1 of n copies of B1. B2 is two copies of. Now, in the, in the description of principal filters, we had uh, an n-dimensional vector space over some field, which is, we can think of it as extension of the underlying field of, uh, of the vector space. Well, those extensions turn out to be some kind of effective uh, ultra products or effective, uh, in our case, effective powers. And we mainly focus here on Q. Um, it turned out that these fields were uh, previously studied in, uh, in logic and uh, in the context of, of arithmetic as effective um, ultra products. They're studied by Pfefferman, Scott, and Tenenbaum, also by Lerman, by uh, Joram Hirschfeld and Wheeler, and by Tom McLaughlin. Um, so they related to, to their work in, uh, in uh, models of non standard models of arithmetic. So those fields that we have in the second description of principal filters, uh, we call uh, these effective ultra powers, we call them uh, cohesive powers. And we can define them for any computable structure, although we'll be interested in the power of the field. In particular, we'll focus on, on Q because we don't know how to handle other fields. But we can define this notion of cohesive power of uh, any computable structure. Um, <coughs> And it's related to this uh, effective ultra products as following. So A is a computable structure for some language L. We have a domain of the structure. I'll separate here uh, the notation for the domain. And we look at a cohesive set of natural numbers. This cohesive set is just cohesive in the classical sense. This will be our index set. And the cohesive power of A over C will be a structure B for the same language as A. And the domain will be, consist of equivalence classes of partial computable functions which map natural numbers into the domain of the structure A. And the domains contain C almost everywhere. Star contains C. So they define on this cohesive set. And the two <coughs> partial functions in the domain are equal if they equal pointwise on, on a set which star contains C. So they're basically they're equal on C. And so we, the elements are really the equivalence classes determined by these partial computable functions, which will denote with brackets the function. For an NRE function symbol f, we define in this new structure that f applied to this n equivalence class is equal to some other equivalence class. If it's true pointwise for every input, x is true, but true in the sense of partial functions. This uh, equality with tilde is equality of uh, partial computable functions sometimes used in computability theory. And when we have an MRE predicate symbol P, then P in this new structure, in the ultra power structure, holds on this equivalence classes phi 1, phi n, if and only if, uh, if we look at all the axes such that when we look at the images of axes under this functions phi, the relation P in the, in the ground structure A holds on elements which, on the set of elements which star contains C. So very much looks at the definition of the ultra, of the ultra product. And of course for a constant symbol C, which we look at a computable function which has constant value in CA, and we look at its equivalence class. Now, um, 
there's some simplification. If a set is cos e, then we can replace um, a partial computable function, an element of this ultra product, by a total computable function. So it can be replaced by f. And um, if a structure is finite, then the ultra product, the ultra, the cohesive power is isomorphic to A. And this is a very easy proof. I wrote it so that we can just get some feel of how to work with these structures. So if uh, phi is in the, the equivalence class of phi is in the cohesive power, then we look for, uh, for every element in the domain, we look for the, for the inputs x um, to this function where the value is A. And because A is finite, and the domain has to contain infinite set C, or star contain, there'll be some element in the domain such that uh, this set XA intersects C is an infinite, intersection is an infinite set. Now if we have a C set which intersects, infinitely intersects cohesive set, well that means that that uh, set has to contain C. Uh, but that tells us that our function phi is actually equal to, to a function phi of A which is uh, one that's, uh, that's, a, that's a constant function. It's equivalence class of a constant function. And, and, uh, so we have this canonical embedding where every element A is mapped into a function which is just a sequence of A's is an isomorphism. Now what happens if, uh, if the field is not finite? Well, we don't have here Wash's theorem, but we have some kind of limited uh, limited uh, correspondence um, of satisfying sentences up to some level. So Dimitrov showed if we have a formula alpha with n variables in the language L, and so we have structure A and we have cohesive power. And if this formula is a Boolean combination of sigma 0, 1 and pi 0, 1 formulas, then we have the, the correspondence in the sense that this formula is true um, this formula is true for some values, uh, equivalence classes of phi 1, phi n in the cohesive power, if and only if, if we look uh, uh, com component-wise, the set of all x is where it's true in A on, on these values, phi i of x, star contains C. He also showed that if we have a sigma 0, 2, pi 0, 2 sentence, um, then this should be if and only if. This is a mistake, actually. If we have a pi zero one sentence, then uh, it should be true in the product if and only if it's true in the ground structure. And for pi zero three sentence, we have only one direction. For, for if sigma is, uh, so that's a type one, sorry, is pi zero three, then if it's true in the cohesive power, then it's true in structure A. And for sigma 0, 2 and pi 0, 2, we have if and only if. I exchange A and B, and then I kept the mistake, so, okay. So, uh, in general, these structures are not elementary equivalent, the cohesive powers in the structure. For example, the structure, uh, if we look at Q, at the field Q of rational numbers, then the cohesive power in the Q are not elementary equivalent, and they break exactly at the, at a sigma three level. So uh, here is a, a sentence um, which will be true in the, which is true in the natural numbers and it's true in the Q, but it will not be true in cohesive power. And that's for every X, there is a stage S. So if we look at all the E's which are less or equal than X, and if uh, the, the phi E, now this is the i partial computable function in the regular enumeration. So this is the, the usual enumeration in computability theory. So if it converges, if phi on x converges, then phi on x converges by stage s. So it can be shown, and I think it's contained in uh, the previous work on uh, models of arithmetic, that this sentence is not true in the, in the cohesive power. Um, so we can think of cohesive power as extension of Q, but it's not elementary equivalent. It's only, sentence is held up only at low level. And also the transcendence degree is infinite. That's easy to show. For example, we can choose the sequence of all prime numbers, P1, P2, and so on, and look at the functions of phi i of n, which map uh, uh, 
phi maps into n maps, uh, n is mapped into pi to the n. So we have p, pi, pi squared, and so on. So the set of all of these equivalence classes will be elements in the cohesive power will be algebraically independent over Q. So we have this um, um, extension of Q. Now, um, it turned out that uh, when looking at the orbits for these very special sets, the m degrees played a, a special role. The m degrees of these maximal sets or the maximal sets in the intersection of quasi-maximal sets. So this probably, everybody knows this. So x is m reducible to y if there is a computable function uh, which maps x is in x if and only if f of x is in y. And um, so it maps x in y and x complement in y complement. And it's one reducible if this function can be one to one. And, uh, and so we have notion of an m degree and we have notion in one degree. So we also have a notion of one star degree. So we say x is one star equivalent to y. If there is set p, which is almost x, and set r, which is star y, such that p and r are one equivalent. And by Michael's isomorphism theorem, x is star, one star equivalent to y, and only if there is a computable permutation of the natural numbers, which maps uh, x, y up to finitely many elements. So um, when we deal with maximal sets, m1 and m2, the m degrees are the same as one star degrees. So it can be shown that m1 is m equivalent to m2, if and only if m1 is one star equivalent to m2. This is, we're using the fact that these sets are maximal. So together with Dimitrov, Russell Miller, and Joe Murad, we showed um, some theorems which independent of vector spaces, uh, but was generated by uh, looking at automorphism of the vector spaces. We showed the following two results for maximal sets m1, m2, and for a field Q. So our structure here is now the A is the field Q of rational numbers because that was the field for the vector space and we're interested in that. So we showed the cohesive power for, uh, of Q over M1 complement. So this is the cohesive uh, complement is isomorphic to the cohesive power Q over complement for M2 if and only if the M degrees or one star degrees of M1 and M2 are the same. We also showed that cohesive power of Q over M1 complement has only trivial automorphism, so this structure is rigid. Um, this is kind of interesting to us because we're looking uh, at the, the automorphisms of the field play role in the automorphisms of the lattice of C sets. Um, the second theorem actually, uh, uh, we couldn't prove it for a while, but then we saw result because we can't bring definability to be at a low level. But then Kuninsman proved uh, that uh, trying, I guess, working in on uh, Hilbert's 10 problem or, or definability that comes out of Hilbert's 10 problem showed that the integers are definable in the rational numbers by, uh, by, a, formula, by a formula with one universal quantifier in the language of rings. So this kind of definability of Z in Q and we can define um, we can also express every uh, natural number as the sum of four integers, and or there are many other definitions. We could use these results for the cohesive power of Q. So this is what Kunitzman proved. He proved that there is a polynomial over Z with the one variable T and then a lot of other variables. I think it's 418, x1, x418, such that Z is definable with this polynomial in the sense that T belongs to Z if and only if um, this polynomial for every, when we plug t, but then for every x1 to x418 does not equal zero. So this is a simplification um, uh, to what Poonen had before. Poonen had for all the exist definition of uh, z within q, and then uh, Julia Robinson had some more complicated before, um, where Poonen had two universal and seven existential quantifiers. So when I tell uh, other mathematicians at uh, my school that uh, this is a simplification, they say, what do you mean? There are 418 variables, so it can be that simpler. Uh, this. Um, so, so we use this definition in our uh, work. 
Now it is uh, just uh, out of curiosity, it's still open whether Z is existentially definable over Q, in Q. Probably not, but. Okay, so he applied these previous results about cohesive power to, to L star V infinity, and now we assume that it's over Q because we use Poonen's result only for Q. We, we, maybe there are other definability results like that in, uh, in fields. There is work like that in, uh, in regard to Diophantine equations and Hilbert stand problem. So if we look over Q and we look at a maximal, um, quasi maximal, uh, rank n quasi-maximal subset of a computable basis. And we assume that n is greater or equal than 3. Because when n is uh, greater or equal than 3, then we have some interesting things about automorphisms. And so if the isomorphism type of the principal filter determined by this vector space v is of the type of being a lattice, a lattice of n of all subspaces of an n-dimensional space over this cohesive power Q. So this lattice is now over a new field. Then this, uh, so and it's important that n is greater than, than, than 2 because when a equals 2, then this lattice is basically 1 infinity, 1 over an infinite field. So this principal filters now fall into infinitely many non-isomorphic classes even when this n is the same, even when they are isomorphic to the lattices of subspaces of finite dimensional vector spaces of the same dimension. So we need to look at that. In order to have orbits in, the, in this lattice, we need to have the, the isomorphic principal filters. So this shows how complicated it's going to be. We also show that every automorphism of L star V infinity uh, in this case, when, when the filter is isomorphic to this lattice of, of uh, subspaces of an n-dimensional vector space over this cohesive power of Q, some cohesive power of Q, um, can be extended to an automorphism of the whole lattice L star V infinity. And moreover, this automorphism is of the, of the type that Ash conjectured, which we'll talk about in a minute. So uh, in E, we, we kind of know what the automorphisms of E of E star are, and there continue many of them. Now, for LV infinity, uh, the automorphisms, Guichard showed that automorphisms are induced by 1, 1, and onto semilinear transformations, which are computable. The fact that the automorphisms of the lattice of subspaces are induced by 1, 1, and onto semilinear transformations, that follows from uh, some theorems of projective geometry but that it's computable was due to the Guichard. And because they're computable, they're only countably many automorphisms of LV infinity. And um, they are induced by um, semilinear transformations. Uh, what are semilinear transformations? Well, the, they're like linear transformations. So we have, except we can have automorphism of the field. So mu, maps, uh, so mu sigma is a semilinear transformation if mu maps vectors into vectors. Sigma is the automorphism of the field. And for every u and v and the scalars a and b, we have that mu of a u plus b v is sigma of a, so the automorphism of the field, mu of u plus sigma of b, mu of, mu of v. Um, and uh, it is not uh, known what the automorphisms or how many of them are for L star V infinity, but Ash conjectured that they're induced by semilinear transformations with finite dimensional kernel and cofinite dimensional images in V infinity. Induced in the sense that uh, the image of the set is just the set of images. Now in our uh, work, uh, we hope to actually get one that's not of Ash's type. But this field turned out to be uh, the cohesive power is a rigid field, so the semi-linear transformations are just linear transformations. So it turned out to be of exactly the type that he. So finally, results about the orbits. So we have these uh, very modest results about orbits for L star V infinity. And uh, we make assumptions that the maximal spaces come from the basis. So if M1 and M2 are maximal subsets of computable bases, omega 1 and omega 2 of V infinity respectively, we can assume they're different, and then we can bring them to the same. Um, then there is an automorphism of L star V infinity where the closure of M1, the span of M1 star, gets mapped into the span of M2 star, if and only if they have the same M degrees. 
or the same one star degrees. So the, and um, what about, we can extend this to quasi-maximal uh, uh, spaces and set that come from quasi-maximal sets, but the situation is much more complicated because we have to deal with uh, lattices of subspaces and, and uh, products of these lattices. So for a quasi-maximal set which has rank n, so it has genuinely it's an intersection of n maximal sets, we introduce notion of a type which captures how many maximal sets we have and on what m degrees. So uh, for example, if these sets have uh, all different m degrees, then the, the principal filter is a Boolean algebra. If they all have the same m degrees, then we're in the, in the lattice situation. And uh, the m degree actually determines the cohesive power, and, and it doesn't matter which cohesive set we take by our isomorphism theorem. If we have some sets of some m degrees and the other of some other m degrees, then we have this uh, product of the lattices. So for quasi-maximal subsets of computable bases omega-1 and omega-2, respectively, there's an automorphism of the whole lattice L star V infinity, which maps the space, the equivalence class of the space generated by B1, so closure B1 star to closure B2 star, if and only if they have the same type. So exactly the same um, number of uh, maximal sets in the intersection of the same M degree. So we don't know much about uh, spaces which are generated but non-extendable bases, and those exist by early results in, uh, by, by Ramel and Rode and Downey and Metakitas. Um, but we know, for example, the following. If a modular lattice 1, 3, 1, this is a modular lattice, is uh, is a principal filter in L star V infinity, then either all coatoms in the filter have C extendable bases or no coatom has it. So coatoms co are these uh, maximal sets, the, the equivalence classes. The same is true if we have one infinity, one lattice as a principal filter. So as a corollary, we get, for example, if V1 and V2 are two maximal spaces <clears throat> such that V1 has an extendable C basis and the other does not have extendable C basis, then uh, if we look at the intersection, at the quasi-maximal intersection of these two maximal sets, then the principal filter is isomorphic to the Boolean algebra B2, so it cannot be like uh, subspaces. Uh, more recently, we did uh, some other work uh, in connection with the automorphisms. And this is more recent work, although the other one is also recent, uh, maybe two years ago, a year ago. The, the other one appeared in computability last year, the one with Dimitrov. This one is published only in the proceedings of uh, some conference. So, uh, so L is the lattice of all subspaces of E infinity. So we look at that lattice. And then within that lattice sits uh, our lattice uh, of CE subspaces. There'll be L0 of E infinity. But if we have any other Turing degree D, we can look at the lattice LD V infinity, which is all D computably enumerable subspaces relative to this oracle, to this uh, Turing degree. So uh, again, the Guichard's theorem works um, if we just, uh, just replace zero by D. And um, every other morphism of this lattice LD of V infinity is induced by some semi-linear transformation mu and sigma, but now uh, mu, both mu and sigma have to be computable in, uh, in D. So they're not uh, anymore, they're bijective semi-linear transformations, but they're not computable, they're decomputable. And so by GSLD, I guess, uh, semi-linear, will denote the group of all of this one to bijective uh, decomputable semi-linear transformations. And um, we show that if, it, it's easy to see that if phi is an automorphism of this lattice LD of infinity, which is induced by, by two of these transformations, mu sigma and mu one sigma one, then they are kind of equivalent up to a scalar multiplication. So there is a scalar gamma such that for every vector, 
mi, mu of uh, v equals gamma mu one of v. So that's no problem. In some sense, this semilinear transformation is unique up to this uh, equivalence. And um, together with Dimitrov and Morozov, we showed that the, uh, the embedding relations on these automorphism structures for these layers in the lattice corresponds to the order on Turing degrees. So for every pair A and B of Turing degrees, we have that uh, automorphism group of LA of infinity is embeddable it can be embedded into the automorphism group for uh, LBV infinity if and only if A is less than B. So this is kind of cute correspondence between Turing degrees and the embedding of the structures. Now, Morozov had such a result, and we used it in our proof, uh, but it's not a trivial translation. He had such a result for uh, permutations on omega, so for structure, the automorphism group of, of just natural numbers with equality. We also look at the degree spectrum of this group GSLD, semi-linear transformations uh, which are computable relative to Turing degree D. And um, so uh, the Turing degree spectrum of a structure is the set of all Turing degrees of isomorphic structures. And the main result here is that tonight that this Turing degree spectrum is, uh, is closed upward in the set of all Turing degrees unless the structure is trivial, in which case it's a singleton. It could be zero if the language is finite, or it could be any Turing degree if the language is infinite. Uh, in this case, it's going to be infinite. So uh, we showed again with uh, Dimitrov and Morozov that the degree spectrum of this group GSLD is uh, the set of all Turing degrees above the cone, which is determined by D double jump. And uh, so if we have just the uh, Guichard's group of uh, computable uh, semilinear uh, bijections, then it will be all the Turing degrees which are above zero double jump. And in this case, we have the least Turing degree in the degree spectrum. That's often called degree of the isomorphism type. And uh, there was also a similar result here for permutations or the symmetry group of omega due to Morozov, uh, but this is a different proof. And maybe I should stop here and thank you all for everything.